This last uh, Thursday was uh, National Day of Prayer. It was also the mayor's prayer breakfast. And I appreciated our new mayor uh, saying that he was going to continue uh, the practice of the mayor's prayer breakfast, believing that prayer was important. So I was very, very appreciative of that. Uh, one of the things that they did at the uh, mayor's prayer breakfast is that they had kids fill out why prayer is important, what it means to them. This is Holden, age eight. Prayer means I can talk to God in heaven and the people who died in heaven like my opa and grandma. I can talk to them whenever I want. And then this one is Abby, age 14. To me, prayer means that I am closer to God and can talk to him freely. When I pray, I feel safe because I know he is watching over me. I want to encourage all of us, make prayer an important priority of your day, of your life. Make it a regular part, you know what I mean? Kind of like food. <laughs> Think about it. Think about uh, what it is and what God is doing and uh, draw in close to him, okay? It's a proven fact scientifically that prayer actually changes things. Today we want to talk about the problem of suffering. We'll talk about Job. I, I really enjoy actually talking about Job, partly because I've, I've lived some of that uh, somewhat in my life. And uh, in these moments uh, where you get in places where you don't want to be and you're there for a long time and you can't do anything about it, and it costs you a lot, and it's very painful. Very painful. And you wish that you didn't have it, but you do, and it's there for a long time. And today we want to talk about a little bit about what Job did about these things. What Job did about these things. Some of you may not understand, why are we doing Job now? Uh, we were with the uh, one blood, one one blood, one people, and uh, we've been on Tower of Babel, and we've been really focusing on the first several chapters of Genesis, because Genesis 1 through 11 is actually the foundation of all Scripture. It is the foundation of all Scripture. By the way, Jesus refers to Genesis 1 through 11 significantly, uh, never questioning the reality or the historicity of the actuals of Genesis 1 through 11. But we come to actually Job because Job is the oldest book in the Bible. It's the oldest book in the Bible. And it is, an, it is a, a serious issue, the problem of pain and suffering and evil. It is probably one of the most significant issues that people today, especially in modern societies, deal with on the existence of God. It's one of the more thorny questions for so many people. But Job, I'm not going to do the whole book because that's a lot, but uh, I just want to be clear on what takes place here. In Job chapter 1, verses 8 through 9, and the Lord said to Satan, have you considered my servant Job, that there is none like him on the earth, a blameless and upright man who fears God and turns away from evil? Now, the, the, this is God's statement on Job. This is God's statement on Job. Okay, just like God made a statement on David, that he was a man after his own heart. But that does not mean that Job is without sin or that Job does not make a mistake or that Job doesn't struggle. It, it is a statement of reality, and God actually makes it. But then Satan answered him, and, and, and the Lord said, answered the Lord and said, and this is an important question. Does Job fear God for no reason? Does Job fear God for no reason? A real easy way to understand this is everybody enjoys their kids when they're being good. So what am I going to say after that? Huh? I remember the first time uh, Stan Shavers, a good friend of mine, and Stan asked me back when I was pastor in Gower if I would speak at the prison because he had uh, business with the, with the federal government providing education to prisoners. And he asked me if I would speak, and so I did. And I spoke in uh, minimal and maximum security. 
there was two graduations. They were in two different areas. And I remember in Maximum, I met three pastors' families that were there at the graduation for their child. And I thought to myself, you know, how difficult that might be to have one of your children go completely opposite of what they're supposed to do. And so the question here is this. Does Job fear God? Does Job love God? Does Job come to God? Does Job relate to God for any other reason than just the fact that he is God? And that's a question, isn't it? Did you know that parents who have handicapped children have a 93% divorce rate? Did you know that? Why? Because it makes it very difficult for the couple to be able to get along together. Very difficult. The point here is this. This is an obvious question. Do you really love me? Do you really love me? You know, every guy has promised a girl, yeah, I love you. <laughs> and yet, it's after that you find out whether it's true or not. Truth is, is that you don't really know the meaning of a relationship until the difficulty comes. Okay? I remember learning to pastor it was easy until I found out that people are hard. Do you ever, do you ever come up with that? Huh? Uh, what's, what, what does the phrase, the honeymoon's over, mean? What do you mean the honeymoon's over? The relationship still continues, right? So again, this is a very honest question. So, won't go into all the details, but a lot of loss took place in Job's life. A lot of loss, quite a bit of death, and tremendous loss of property and well-being took place in his life. But then here is his answer in chapter 1, verses 20 through 22. Then Job arose and tore his robe and shaved his head and fell on the ground. Now notice this. He's not a weirdo that doesn't notice reality. He is engaged with reality completely. He tore his robe, shaved his head, and fell on the ground. I can tell you, I've been on the tile in my life. Literally on the tile in total despair. Completely and totally in despair. I've been frustrated and kicked doors open with my foot. I've done a lot of things because of the reality of my life. Job is being real. But here's something that he did that I haven't always done. He was real with what was going on in life, but he worshiped. He worshiped. And he said, naked I came from my mother's womb, and naked shall I return. The Lord gave, and the Lord has taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Now, I will notice this. God didn't actually kill anyone nor does the Lord actually tempt anyone, nor did the Lord invent or cause evil. It's important for us to understand that. But God gave. You ever taken away something from one of your kids? Huh? What do they say? Thank you? That's not fair. That's not fair. I want you to understand it's not a matter that God actually purposely, maniacally wants to take things away from people. But things do happen. Things do happen. And Job's answer shows that he believes in God for more than just pleasure. He believes in God for more than just pleasure. By the way, You'll never see a sermon, The Problem with Pleasure. It's always going to be a sermon about the problem with pain, the problem with evil, the problem with suffering. Nobody ever has a question of, I just don't understand why we have nice days. 
Nobody says that. I don't understand why my car worked today. I don't understand that. Nobody says those things. So Joe points out the fact that I have been given. I've been given everything I have. I came naked with nothing but life. And I have been given everything. It's a matter of understanding. In all this, Job did not sin or charge God with wrong. But then, Satan again speaks with God and essentially challenges the fact, okay, so Job did not sin, charge God, curse God, and die on the issue of others and possessions, but if you touch his body, he will curse you to your face. He will curse you to your face. In Job chapter 3, and the Lord said to Satan, have you considered my servant Job, that there's none like him on the earth, a blameless and upright man who fears God and turns away from evil? He still holds fast his integrity. He still holds fast his integrity. You really don't know who you are, and you don't really know what you're made of until you have trouble. Winning never teaches you anything. It's only losing that really teaches you. It's loss that actually makes us understand how meaningful things are. And I want you to understand that he is actually stating here that he's held fast, meaning the answer to the question is, does Job serve God for nothing? Is, yeah. So far, yeah. Although you entice me against him to destroy him without reason, then Satan answered the Lord and said, skin for skin. All that a man has, he will give for his life. But stretch out your hand and touch his bone and his flesh, and he will curse you to your face. Verse 9. Then his wife said to him, do you still hold fast to your integrity? Do you still hold fast to your integrity? Are you still going to hold on to this? Have you ever had people ask you that question? How can you believe in God? How can you trust in God? All this trouble that's been in your life, all this difficulty, how can you believe in God? People do ask us those questions. I don't know what to make of Job's wife. I, I don't know if she's, you know, compassionately wanting to pull the plug on him or if she is kind of cantankerous. I don't know. I don't think we know. Do we know? I don't know if she's benevolent or if she's actually just kind of tired of it. But the reality is, is that she is most certainly bringing the question to him. Curse God and die. But he said to her, you speak as one of the foolish women would speak. Shall we receive good from God? And shall we not receive what? Evil. I think every parent would like to keep pain away from their children. I really do think that you would like that. But I think we call that spoiled. Do we not? As a matter of fact, I think the parent that sends their kid out without any pain experience is actually setting them out for a very difficult life because it's already begun so ensconced in their lives that when difficulty does come, and it will come, that they won't know how to handle it or what to do. So it is a very important thing for us to understand that difficulty is a part of life. And all this, Job did not sin with his lips. Did not sin with his lips. Then the answer, Job chapter 2, verses 11 through 13, comes to the reality of his friends. <clears throat> now when Job's three friends heard all this evil that had happened upon, that had come upon him, they came each from his own place, Eliphaz the Temanite, Bildad the Shuhite, and Zophar the Themanite, and they made an appointment together to come to show him sympathy and comfort him. <laughs> I just want to tell you, myself personally, I've had to learn, and I want to encourage you to understand. Some of the things that we say are not comforting. Don't ever say to somebody, they're in a better place. Don't do that. You know why? Because that's not the issue. 
The issue isn't where they are. The issue is where they aren't. You know, when Sarah was born and we were in the ICU of uh, Children's Mercy, I watched every one of those babies die, all of them. Every day, the babies around her all died. This is an excruciating thing to watch. And we just got real close to ours and just stayed there. I didn't know what to say. I didn't know what to do. Do you know that a NICU nurse does not last very long? I forget what the actual term is. I think it's a year and a half. They can't take it. They can't take it. I want you to understand, sometimes we need to really just be quiet. And we need to just simply say, I don't understand what you're going through. I don't understand how you feel. But I do want you to know I care. And I brought you this Twinkie. <laughs> something. Something nice. Okay? When we're in a hospital all the time, there's one thing a friend actually brought us all through the years. A roll of quarters. Because back in the day, when you didn't have so much in the hospitals, okay, they didn't used to have food courts. You know what they had? Vending machines and a microwave. And when we got a roll of quarters, how much is a roll of quarters? $10, okay, $10. We loved a roll of quarters, a roll of quarters. All I want you to understand is this, is that be very careful about what you say. Most of the time you're comforting yourself, not the other person. You need to be very careful about what you say. Presence is more ministerial than words. Presence is more ministerial than words. A hug is worth a thousand words, okay? I just want to encourage you to understand that. I have learned through difficulty, as well as I'm sure some of you, is that friends are not always helpful. They're well-intentioned, but not always helpful. I don't think these fellows came together to actually hurt Job. I really honestly don't think they did. But as we go and watch the rest of these chapters, we find out, yeah, they're a little tough. They're a little tough. So they came to sim for sympathy and comfort. And when they saw him from a distance, they did not recognize him. And they raised their voices and wept. And they tore their robes and sprinkled dust on their heads toward heaven. And they sat with him on the ground seven days and seven nights. And no one spoke a word to him, for they saw that his suffering was very great. And that was the good thing. And I think if they'd have stuck with that, it might have been better. It's important to understand the ministry of presence with people. It's important to understand how valuable that really is. Just remember, Jesus did not get rid of all the evil of this world. But he was Emmanuel. He was God with us. He is still God with us. Still God with us. So these fellas, they kind of had some things that they said, and their things were not exactly the best, but they were there, and that is important, and that is, and that is love, and that, it, that really does help people. In Job chapter 40, we really get, you know, an answer that comes from God. And the Lord says, adorn yourself with majesty and dignity. Clothe yourself with glory and splendor. Pour out the overflowings of your anger and look on everyone who is proud and abase him. Look on everyone who is proud and bring him low and tread down the wicked where they stand. Hide them in all the dust together. Bind their faces in the world below. Then I also acknowledge to you that your own right hand can save you. Meaning God is actually asking him the question, do you think you can solve all the problems of the world? Do you think that you have all the answers and so on and so forth? I want to tell you something. When you deal with people who want to present a problem to you, give it back to them and ask them for the answer. They often have a gripe, but they have no solutions. Did you notice that? Okay. What's your answer? 
Oh, uh, well, I'm just good at bringing up problems. I don't, I don't have an answer. No, you'll find that most people are like that. They're really good about bringing up problems. They're very short on bringing up solutions. And I want you to know that God is actually saying to Job, he's saying, hey, look, you think you can take care of all these things? Now, there's, several, there's two chapters, at least, of, of things that, that God brings up with Job. By the way, it is a walk through creation. It is one of the greatest emphasis of God's personal hand in creation. He talks about, I'm the creator. That's why creation is so important. So important. But in verse 6, even if I should choose to boast, I would not, excuse me, I'm sorry. This is actually... In 2 Corinthians, and I want you to see, even if I should choose to boast, Paul's talking about the things that he's gone through. I would not be a fool because I would be speaking the truth, but I refrain so no one will think more of me than is warranted by what I do or say. I feel that way sometimes. You know, I'm still holding my integrity. I'm faithful to my wife. I've dealt with my lusts, I've dealt with my greed, I've dealt with my pride, I continue to deal with it on a daily basis. I am most certainly walking through life and trying to keep my faith, but I have made mistakes, big ones, along the way. People say to you, well, you know, Dave, you're a really nice guy. No, I'm not, I'm not. God is pretty good. And I'm hanging with him. The only good I have is because of God. I'd be with all my other Colorado and smoking pot in Colorado and acting like, you know, there's nothing wrong. The reality is, is that I'm not a good person. And when Job brings this, I mean, when Paul brings this up, he's saying, look, I've had all these wonderful things take place and so on. But... Because of these surpassing great revelations, therefore, in order to keep me from becoming conceited, you get that? From becoming conceited. Um, I remember the illustration a long time ago of a great organist who gave huge concerts to people. And this is one of those, you know, pipe organs where the air is necessary and so on. And... Uh, Back then, before they had all the energy and the motors and all that kind of stuff, it took human energy to actually make the air. So for the great player, it was for all the people, and making this beautiful melody, there was a guy in the basement that was pumping his heart out, keeping that air going. And one day, the great musician said... What are you complaining about? I'm the one that makes beautiful music. Just shut up and do your job. But that's the way people get when they believe in themselves. They get conceited. I don't think you know, but all addiction is actually based in self-preservation and arrogance. All of it. All of it. So guess what the guy in the basement did? The concert's ready to start. Thousands of people are gathered. Money has been paid. Lights are on. And he steps to the organ and starts to play. And all you can hear is the sound of his fingers on the keys. And at that moment, it occurred to him, I am not alone in this. I have others to thank. You know, you'll see people grow up and actually become arrogant and think that they actually know more than everybody else. In reality, they're not recognizing all the people that changed their diapers and fed them food and kept them safe and rescued them and took care of them and paid for them and so on. So Paul's actually saying... If I, if I did this, I would be conceited. I was given a thorn in my flesh, a messenger of Satan, to what? Now notice where this thorn comes from. Notice where this thorn comes from, because we got the same thing over in Job. We got the same thing over in Job. And when Jesus comes to his own moment of temptation, who is it that tempts him? Satan. Just understand that. Please do not charge God with wrong. 
Please do not charge God with wrong. Let me just point out something to you. Do you know what's right and wrong? Do you know what's right and wrong? Do you know what's right and wrong? I guess I'm just going to have to stand here. You're not going to commit to it, are you? Okay, kids, I want you to know your parents will not recognize that they know right from wrong. You willing to go with that one? Of course not. What I want you to understand is this. Yes, you know right from wrong, and guess what? You do wrong anyway. And you do it to your own kids who you're supposed to take care of. This is my question to all the atheists and all the agnostics and all the people that want to charge God with all this wrong. Why don't you do right? Dawkins, why did you divorce your wife? Why'd you leave your children? Hawking, I guess there was a lady taking care of you all the time. You couldn't have done all that thinking if there wasn't somebody wiping your beer, you know, rear end. No, come on. Let's be serious, okay? Somebody invented a machine and made it possible for him to communicate. And they act like they're all to themselves. But in reality, their entire life is based in conceit and arrogance. They're not recognizing the pumper in the basement, (laughs) okay? And I want you to understand that because Paul brings it up here and he says, hey, three times I plead with the Lord, take it away from me. But he said to me, My grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. I remember saying to my dad, you know, dad, I don't understand why I got to go to work every day and do the things that you want me to do. Why don't you just give me what I need? Why do you have to make me go to work all the time? Why do we have to get up at six o'clock and go? Why couldn't we get up at eight? (laughs) Last night I was out all night. I'm not really able to go to work today. And you know what my dad would say to me? Too bad, get up, let's go. I remember one time I complained about the shoes that he bought me. (laughs) Yeah, he took them away, took all my shoes away. (laughs) He said, here, there you go, go get you some. (laughs) All all I want you to understand is this, don't get too theoretical, theoretical on this issue. Pay attention to the realities, to the actual realities. I want you to see here that God says, my grace is sufficient for my power is made perfect. It's complete when? In weakness. Therefore, I will boast all the more gladly about my weaknesses. My friends, that's the answer to all addictions. That's the answer to all addictions. I am powerless. but God and others can give me strength. Amen? Amen. Therefore, I will boast all the more gladly about my weakness so Christ's power may rest on me. That's why, for Christ's sake, I delight in weaknesses, in insults, in hardships, in persecutions, in difficulties. I want you to know that the fact is is that I honestly and sincerely appreciate the teachers that failed me. More than I do necessarily the ones I made the straight up A. I remember going to my philosophy professor because I love philosophy and I went to him and I said, I don't understand why I can't make more than a C. (laughs) And he looked at me and he said, well, it's a quandary, Dave. (laughs) He didn't give me a bit of help. You know what I wanted him to say? I'll make an easier test for you, son, and you can do better. That's what I wanted him to say. But by golly, two semesters later, when I made a straight up A and nobody else in the class did, I was like, yeah. You know how I got there? Because I had to go through the pain of actually doing the work that it takes to get to that place of making an A. And I want you to understand, altruism today, if you... I don't know if you're familiar with this, but the belief or in our, our practice of disinterested and selfless concern for the well-being of others. Altruism. Where does it come from? Where does it come from? I want you to understand that the world's answer to this is not consistent or true. It's not consistent or true. Altruism. To better understand altruism, investigators for decades have devised laboratory games 
to quantitate human generosity. People often score high in the laboratory. However, however, in the real world, guess what they do? Guess what they do? They get selfish. They get selfish. By the way, I believe one of the greatest logical conclusions to the issue of evil and suffering is communism. The government will take care of you. The government is benevolent. Okay? And when I'm in Cuba, the people there, they love the government. They think it's really good. I'm being sarcastic. They don't like it at all. You know why? Because they don't do anything kind. They are totally selfish. Where's the altruism? Where is the altruism? It is a painful question in itself because it deals with pain. Pain is a real thing. It's not an imaginary thing. There are many ways that one can approach an answer, but C.S. Lewis used to remind us that is critically important to examine the assumptions within a question. And I remember years ago at the University of Nottingham when I'd finished a talk when a person stood up, and all a student stood up and shouted from the floor and he said, you know, there's too much of evil in this world. There can't be a God. There's too much of evil and suffering in this world. And the irony of that question to me was, you know, I come from the East and I live in the West. I don't ever remember being asked this question in the East. Now they do because of all the cross-pollination of thinking and all of that. But it's hardly ever addressed. In Islam, you hardly ever find a book dealing with this subject. It's inshallah. It's the will of Allah, you know. And in the pantheistic system, it's karma. You're paying your debt and so on. It's in the Western world where we actually live with the greatest comforts that we raise the question about pain and suffering. But this Englishman raised it and I said to him, why don't I make it clear first why you are asking this question and what your assumptions are. I said, when you say there's evil, aren't you assuming there's such a thing as good? He paused and he said, uh, yes. I said, when you say there's such a thing as good, aren't you assuming there's such a thing as a moral law on the basis of which to differentiate between good and evil? He struggled with this and we interacted and finally he said, yeah, there would have to be an objective moral standard from which to dis differentiate between good and evil. I said, when you say there's a moral law, you must posit a moral law giver, but that's whom you're trying to disprove and not prove because if there's no moral law giver, there's no moral law. If there's no moral law, there's no good. If there's no good, there's no evil. Uh, what is your question? <laughs> and he looked at me, paused, and he said, what then am I asking you? Now, this was years ago. I said, I know what you're asking, man. I'm not trying to make it hard for you. It's an existentially felt question that often doesn't examine the logical presuppositions within this. God has to remain in the paradigm for the question to be real, and therefore the answer has to come from what God's purposes and God, God's description is all about reality. In a recent book that I co-authored with Vince Vitale, my colleague from Oxford, we called it Why Suffering. My opening chapter was what is called the trilemma. God is all-powerful, God is all-loving, and there is evil. That's the trilemma. The three realities that J.L. Mackey, the Australian philosopher, says are incoherent. God is all-powerful, God is loving, evil exists. He says it's an incoherence. So my question is, why is it a trilemma and not a quadrilemma or a quintilemma? Introduce one more. God is all-knowing. That's also a belief we have. And number five, God is eternal. God is not judging everything just in time. There's an eternity. So it's not just the, the, the question is stacked when it's stacked as a trilemma. God is also all-knowing and eternity also exists as a reality. And maybe those explanations can come in eternity. Let me just move to two quick answers in this. There's a young gal in Georgia where I live. I live in Atlanta. And uh, she, uh, her first name is uh, Ashlyn. And uh, one day her mother was on a television program discussing a strange problem that she has, which is called SIPA, congenital insensitivity to pain with anhydrosis. She cannot feel pain and her sweat glands don't work. The problem may sound good, you don't feel any pain. 
But the reality is, if she steps on a nail while she's on the sports field, it could puncture the skin, create an infection, and nobody could be even aware of it. The mother said the problems it has created in her life for what this malady brings into her body. She says, I pray one prayer every night. God, please let my daughter help to feel pain. She could put a hand on a burner and not know that a hand is burning. Pain actually has a role in God's work in our life. It's important to understand that God is eternal and not every answer to life is going to be answered actually in the physical life. That there's more to life than simply the physical. And I want you to understand, this is Horatio Spafford and his wife and his children. After he lost everything in the Chicago fire, he sent his wife and children away to be, uh, to have a getaway and so on, and yet they actually had a loss and they lost both children. This is her note to him. In 1873, you've heard it before, saved alone. She was the only one that lived. They lost their children. So he became, as in his life, actually very much like Job in that he lost everything. And he actually, upon going and joining his wife and actually at the place where the captain said, this is a close proximity to where your children died, where the accident took place, uh, he wrote these words. This is his actual handwriting, uh, and he wrote these words at that moment. When peace like a river attendeth my way, when sorrows like sea billows roll, whatever my lot thou hast taught me to say, it is well, it is well with my soul. It is well, it is well, it is well with my soul. Though Satan should buffet, though trials should come, let this blessed assurance control that Christ has regarded my helpless estate and hath shed his own blood for my soul. It is well, it is well, it is well with my soul. My sin, oh the bliss of this glorious thought, My sin, not in part, but the whole, is nailed to the cross, and I bear it no more. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, O my soul. It is well, it is well with my soul. I want you to understand his answer there includes his forgiveness of sin. Because you see, God has done more than just simply made us and then acts helpless about evil. He actually conquered evil on the cross and out of the grave. Do you understand that? Do you understand that Jesus is the sacrificial lamb? Do you understand the entire sacrificial system of hundreds and thousands of years of sacrifice and that the temple was actually taken away and the curtain was ripped from top to bottom and the Lord actually took away any ability for anyone to actually fulfill the law anymore? Why? Why? Because God paid for it. God paid for it. He paid for it. This is really an important question for you to answer. And here's the reason why. Your answer to pain is huge. It's huge. All the trouble in your life comes from your answer to handling your pain. Handle it with anger. Go ahead. Do that. Handle it with resentment. Handle it with bitterness and murder, malice and slander. Go ahead and handle your pain that way. What if everybody does that? What if everybody does that? I'm really upset. I'll run you over. Oh, I think that's what we are doing. Huh? Huh? How come the evolutionists aren't just simply saying, well, that's process of survival of the fittest? What is the evolutionist's answer to death? It's the process of actually getting better. It's very much like Scrooge saying, just less surplus to humanity. Reduce the human burden of the poor. What I want you to understand is is that our answer to this question is huge. 
When I have pain, I drink until I'm numb. When I have pain, I sleep and never wake up. When I have pain, I don't go to work. When I have pain, I leave the people that cause me pain. When I have pain, I reach out and do things that are very destructive. Things that almost always draw me away from other people, draw me away from actual meaning and actual love and actual relationship. What I want you to understand is this question of pain is huge. And the only answer we have in America is this. Commit suicide and you won't have any pain anymore. Am I wrong? That's what the existentialists came up with a long time ago. And you are living the reality of existential philosophy where everything is based upon your personal experience as truth. Therefore, the only answer any individual has to the issue of pain is what? To die. A child is born with birth defects. What do we do? Kill them. An elderly person is difficult and hard to take care of, not even thankful. What do we do? Kill them. This is the answer that the world has to offer. What does God say? What does God say? Therefore, since we have been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Through him we have also obtained by faith into this grace in which we stand and we rejoice in what? Hope of the glory of God. Not only that, but we rejoice in our sufferings knowing that suffering produces endurance and endurance produces character and character produces hope and hope does not put us to shame because God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who he has given us. Now I want to remind you today, God and his grace is the only answer to pain. The only answer to pain. The only answer to pain. It is his place and work in our lives that gives our lives what? Meaning and purpose and value. We do not live like animals. Did you know that animals are responsible for five million attacks upon people last year? Five million people were attacked by their animals, most of them domestic. Mammals are the biggest offenders. 58 people lost their lives per 10,000 from the animals. What I want you to understand is we are not animals. We were made in the image of God. We are more valuable, more meaningful, and there is more purpose to our life. And we don't just live for this life. What do we live for? Eternity. Eternity. Isn't it sad when a person thinks the only way they can become significant or the only way they can solve their pain is by killing people and killing themselves? And yet that is the direction that our ideology in our society is actually developing. Look around and see all the hospitals. Most of them have what kind of name? Religious Christian names. Why? Because you see, the answer that God has to pain is to alleviate suffering by sacrifice and love. And I want to encourage you to understand the only answer is the answer in Job. Naked I was born, <laughs> naked I shall return. Praise be God who has given me life. Amen? Amen? Let's stand together. As we sing this song, 
please consider the significance of what I've talked about. And I'd really like for you to answer for yourself this. How do you solve your pain? Vodka? Red wine? Few pills? Cutting? Beating up people? Cussing others? How do you solve your pain? I'd encourage you to look to God and see the cross and know how to answer pain. It is by sacrifice and love. As you sing this song, you consider your life.